Euh, D'abord, je voudrais m'excuser pour euh, mes compatriotes euh, de parler dans la langue de Shakespeare. C'est toujours un peu étrange de parler anglais en France. D'ailleurs, je remarque que je ne parle pas le même anglais, <rire> probablement, <rire> pour qu'il soit plus compréhensible par des, par des Français. Mais, uh, so I just was a note to my French compatriots, the apology that I would speak English. I always feel strange to speak English in France. Uh, I want to thank Tom Slater, but also Paul Kirkness and Frank for their hard work behind the scenes to make this event possible, the third conference of the uh, network on advanced urban marginality. Uh, I want to welcome you all to Paris. Um, and I welcome you to these debates at the intersection of urban marginality uh, and the state. What I hope to do today is to stimulate you uh, to rethink the state in its dealing with what we can call generically problem categories and problem territories. That is the populations pushed or trapped at the bottom of symbolic social and physical space in the metropolis. I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to do is use the contemporary transformation of social, but especially penal policies. And by that I refer to the shift from protective welfare to disciplinary workfare on the one side, and the shift from a relatively small Malthusian criminal justice system uh, focused on rehabilitation to a hypertrophic, hyperactive uh, criminal justice system uh, focused on neutralization and the pornographic representation of state power. <coughs> I'm going to use these contemporary transformations of social and penal policies, and especially penal policies, and especially the return of the prison to the forefront of advanced societies as a means of pushing us to change our conception of the Leviathan. And here I'm going to rely on two ideas that are not self-evident or conventional. First, I'm going to argue the prison is not a technical appendage but a core political capacity, and we cannot think the state without thinking or rethinking the prison. <coughs> and indeed, I'm going to argue that sort of coming to the prison is a very fruitful avenue to rethink the state, even though uh, the prison, incarceration, punishment, do not figure in the list of canonical objects of political sociology. If you, if you pick up a, a handbook of political sociology, if you look at the sort of state of knowledge of political sociology, Typically, you will not see a single reference or maybe a passing reference to crime and criminal justice. And I'm going to argue this is a major failing of political sociology. Second, I'm going to argue the prison is also interesting because it's an urban institution. And I would argue it's a, it's a pivotal urban institution. Since its origins, the prison has always been used to manage urban marginality. Indeed, indeed, indeed we're going to see shortly that this is why it was invented in the first place. The prison was not invented in the 16th century in order to fight crime. It was invented in order to manage urban marginality. So it is a little surprise that, just as it was invented for that purpose in the late 16th century, that in the late 20th century, early 21st century, it would return to that historic mission. And it would therefore come back onto uh, the forefront of the institutional uh, stage. Even as, uh, if, uh, to, to just uh, refresh your memory, 30 or 40 years ago, experts in, in criminal justice were convinced that the prison was an institution on its way out. Uh, so I'm going to argue that, um, I'm, I'm going to urge you to bring the state back in, in the study of urban marginality, but a different kind of state. Um, and to grasp the form and dynamics of urban marginality in the advanced societies, I'm going to argue that we must revoke the conventional conception of the state as an ambulance. There's three conceptions of the state that, are, that dominate the, the literature today uh, when you look at the state and urban marginality. One uh, portrays the state as a sort of ambulance that rushes to the scene of the accident after poverty has emerged. Um, another looks at the state as a service counter that delivers <coughs> goods and services, nostrums, downstream when again the problem of urban marginality has arisen <coughs> after inequality and insecurity have set in. And a third conception, which is sort of the neoliberal, the dominant neoliberal conception, is this, the state is looked on as an intruder that intervenes, so-called, in the economy and society after they are supposed to become organized on their own. And we hear, I think, there's a deep complicity between <coughs> the, the self propelling market, which does not exi has never existed historically, 
and also the very loose and I think very uh, mushy and confusing concept of civil society. <coughs> Instead of being enemies, I think they each reinforce one another. Um, and the state is supposed to be that entity that sits outside of the state and civil society, when in reality, the state is a central agency of symbolic and material power that has organized the market or made the market possible and shaped society or social space. So I'm going to argue we should construe the state as a stratifying and classifying agency that shapes social space, that molds categories. Um, the state acts upstream to determine the incidence, the persistence, the intensity, and the social and spatial distributions of poverty by setting the basic parameters of symbolic space, what categories are, are, are efficient in a given universe, are shared categories of perception, by shaping the basic parameters of social space, the distribution of efficient resources, and the organization of physical space, and by anchoring the structural homologies between them, between symbolic space, social space, and physical space, by in particular instituting and allocating forms of capital and by determining their conversion rate. In so doing, I'm going to make insights from two authors that are rarely brought together, Gusta Esping Anderson, who teaches us in his studies of the welfare state that the welfare state is not a remedial agency but a stratifying agency, and I'm going to bring that together with the teachings of Pierre Bourdieu, who taught us that the state is a classifying agency, particularly in his work on higher education. And essentially what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to take S, S, Gusta Esping Anderson's argument about welfare and transfer them to the penal wing of the state. I'm going to say just like Esping Anderson tells you that uh, the social wing of the state is a stratification agency, I'm going to argue the criminal justice wing of the state is a stratification agency. And I'm going to take Bourdieu's argument about elite schools, uh, that they are a classification machinery that produces... Uh, um, uh, categories uh, legitimate the, the, the privilege of the dominant. I'm going to argue that this is true, and Bourdieu is right about the uh, elite schools at the top, but there's another classification agency, another agency of sociology. It's the criminal justice system. And I'm going to argue that just like the elite schools provide this positive sociology of privilege at the top, justifying the eminent position of those who have largely inherited social and cultural capital and economic capital. I'm going to argue that the criminal justice system serves to fulfill a function of negative sociology at the bottom. It justifies the exclusion, the dereliction of those who are shorn of capital to start with. Uh, so I'm going to make these insights from uh, Esping, Anderson, and Bourdieu to sketch the ways in which the neoliberal Leviathan has both produced and managed dispossession and dishonor in the neighborhoods of relegation of the United States and Western Europe over the past three decades by the simultaneous rolling out and organizational meshing of restricted social policy on the one hand and expensive penal policy uh, on the other hand. <coughs> so um, one of the ways, uh, uh, sort of more economical way of getting into these issue, the issues, issues would have been, I'm going to take the prison seriously as an urban institution, as an institution that manages urban marginality. And if I'm going to take um, the prison uh, uh, seriously, then the first major fact that faces me is the return of the prison. I would even argue the return and the rehabilitation of the prison. And again here, for those who don't know these debates, uh, around 1975 when Foucault publishes Discipline and Punish, there's a general consensus. Foucault is not an innovator in that regard. There's a general consensus among uh, mainstream penologists, among mainstream criminologists, among critical historians of penality, that the prison is on its way out. The prison is a doomed institution. It's, it's about to disappear. Just to give you how, an idea of how strong that belief was, in 1965, the leading uh, criminal uh, uh, lawyer or legal scholar in the United States, Norval Morris, an eminent professor at the University of Chicago, not exactly the law school of the University of Chicago, I'll remind you, uh, along with the Chicago School of Economics, is the founder of the vision of the, you know, of the, the neoliberal vision of the world. The not, so not exactly left-wing uh, crazies. Uh, Norval Morris says, in a decade, we will only know the prison um, as a name or as a sort of historical memory. When he writes this, the United States is seeing a decline in its prison population by about 1% a year. That decline ends in 1973 when the U.S. has 380,000 inmates. Today the U.S. has 2.4 million inmates. and has become world leader in incarceration and 
exporter of zero tolerance and super punitive policies, and around the world um, in Western Europe, but also in second uh, world societies such as Ar Argentina, Brazil, much of Latin America, many of the <coughs> countries issued uh, of the collapse of the Soviet uh, Union <coughs> um, uh, have uh, seen a dramatic increase in their, in their incarceration rate. So the, what do prisons have to do with marginality? and the state. I'm going to argue everything. I want here to draw a parallel, essentially, between the late 16th century and the late 20th century. The prison was invented in the late 16th century not to tackle crime, but to tackle urban marginality, a problem that was known in England as the problem of the sturdy beggar, that is, an able-bodied person who is sitting on the street begging and not working. I would argue that the prison has made a stunning comeback to the institutional forefront of advanced societies when everyone predicted its demise for decades ago to tackle new forms of urban marginality. The rise of the penal state is a political response to the rise of a new regime of, a, of marginality that I characterize as advanced marginality in my book Urban Outcast. Thus, <coughs> its intersection obviously with class and ethnic division, racial division in the United States, ethno-national division with uh, post-colonial migrants in the European Union. Second, I'm going to argue that the prison emerged in the 16th century as a key institution in state building in early modern Europe as part of the monopolization and signaling of authority. I'm going to argue, similarly, late 20th century, early 21st century, the expansion and the glorification of the penal institution is part and parcel of the building of the neoliberal state. Law and order provides a key stage, a platform uh, uh, for staging sovereignty. So um, the penal state, in, in, in essence, is there to help us as we turned uh, to resolve the problem, of, uh, the problem of the two Karls. And when I mention the problem of the two Karls, typically people think, well, obviously one of these Karls is going to have a beard. You must mean <laughs> some the Karl Disappointment for the beard lovers. The two Karls are Karl Polanyi and Karl Schmidt. Neither of them wears a beard. The Karl Polanyi problem. In the Great Transformation, Polanyi points out that the coming of the market tends to erode the society, creating disorder and turbulence, and in city, urban marginality, and that people resist its rule, and thus this leads to the counter-movement. Society reacts, fights against the market, and there's a creation of working class organization, trade unions, um, social service agencies, support, and so on. This is the counter-movement. My argument is going to be the penal wing of the state has been rolled out to curb these disorders, to warehouse the supernumerary elements of the post-industrial working class, and to impose the discipline of insecure wage work, the counter-movement to the rise of advanced urban marginality has come from within the state, not from the bottom of social space. It's come from within the bureaucratic field by the reassertion of the preeminence a priority of the right-hand side of the state. We're going to get to that in a minute. So wrapping up the penal state, which can take a variety of form in the US, it has been prison fair, the massive expansion of the prison system, in Western Europe, particularly in France, I would call it police fair, the activation of the police without a comp comparable expansion of the prison system, but an extraordinary um, uh, uh, intensification of police activity in and around the neighborhoods of relegation where advanced marginality has coalesced. And I'll cite just a uh, simple indicator. Uh, in France, between 2000 and 2010, there's been uh, nearly a tripling of a procedure called garde à vue, where you're arrested by the police, brought to the prison, to the police lockup, uh, to see whether charges are going to be brought against you. Typically, you stay a few hours, or oftentimes uh, overnight, and then you are released the next day without any charges being pressed, without, without anything having happened officially. The number of garde à vue in France has tripled uh, in, in the 2000s uh, to reach the astronomical figure of nearly one million garde à vue. This is not one million individuals because Precisely, some individuals are arrested again and again, multiple times during the, the, a, a month or a year, so that you know, we don't know exactly how many individuals are concerned. We do not have official statistics, but I would be willing to bet my salary for the next year uh, that if we had the data, it would show that upwards of 70% of all the persons who are arrested in Garda Vue come from the 577 officially designated sensitive neighborhoods of France. So this is... <coughs> this is the um, so we, what I'm going to argue is that essentially uh, the rolling out of the penal state, the research to the prison, is a reaction from within the state to the onset of advanced marginality, a means of 
curtailing the turbulence and disorders <coughs> created by the advance uh, of marginality. And the second is the Carl Schmitt problem. In Der Begriff der Politischen, Schmidt proposes that the essence of the political is the friend-enemy distinction. To stage political fortitude and to project sovereignty in an age where polit politicians increasingly abandon the traditional protective missions of the state on the social and economic front, what better strategy could you find than to designate as the internal enemy of the law-abiding working family the Enos underclass composed of welfare mothers or welfare cheats uh, and street criminals. This is the theme in today's debate in France of l'assistanat. There are people who live sort of permanently whose job is to live off of welfare, the, the welfare scroungers and the street criminals. Uh, in this perspective, the criminal becomes the enemy and thus we see the spread of the militaristic trope of war, the war on crime, the war on drugs, the war on anti-social behavior. And that, I argue, is a reaction from within the state to the rise of advanced marginality to do what? To signal, this is the symbolic function of penality, to symbol, to stage the authority of the state and to signal sovereignty precisely in an era where the sovereignty of the state is being, um, is being eroded from the top by the high velocity of financial capital, from the bottom uh, by the uh, social turbulence created by the withdrawing of economic regulation and social welfare protection. And so, <coughs> then we find Bourdieu as a tool <coughs> to, so, so how do you so solve your Cal, your Cal Polanyi problem? How do you curb the disorders created by economic deregulation? How do you resolve the deficit of legitimacy that political elites face when they shrink the economic and social missions of the state? Well, the solution is by reorganizing the bureaucratic field. And what we're going to see is essentially the building of the neoliberal state is a rightward tilting of the bureaucratic field um, uh, whereby the, the, the disciplinary pole of the bureaucratic field uh, colonizes and subordinates the protective pole of uh, the bureaucratic field. Um, so, um, if I had more time, I would draw a, a very quick portrait uh, um, of, um, of the, the resurgence of incarceration around the world. Uh, um, I'm just going to say briefly that we live in the third great age of confinement after the late 16th century, which saw the blossoming of the prison, and the mid-19th century, which saw the routinization of its use as a means of criminal control, uh, belying the prophecies made between 1945 and 75 that it was a doomed institution, fated to decline, if not to disappear, the prison has made a spectacular return to the institutional forefront across the First and the Second World. With precious few exceptions, incarceration has increased in all post-industrial societies, with the onset of hyper-incarceration in the United States, a five-fold increase in, in 30 years, even as uh, crime first stagnated and then dropped precipitously, precipitously after 1973, a steady and sturdy growth across Western Europe, and as I mentioned, spectacular ex expansion in Second World societies, and a huge growth in the nation states issued from the collapse of the Soviet Empire. Worldwide, the prison population has jumped from over 8 million in 1998 to uh, over 10 million uh, today, and that's these figures are exclusive of administrative detentions in China, which are about around 1 million. But for China, we don't really know exactly what the figures are. And they would sort of swamp and change the whole uh, the world, uh, the world statistics. Uh, moreover, this unforeseen and relentless rise in the carceral population is only one crude surface manifestation of the extension and exaltation of the penal state. Among other indicators are the elevation of crime fighting to the rank of government priority everywhere, the salience of insecurity in election campaigns, the criminal hyperactivity on the legislative front. For instance, California in the 1980s uh, passed um, uh, over a thousand laws extending the use of the prison. New labor in England uh, during its 10 years in power instituted a stunning 3,605 <coughs> new uh, criminal offenses liable to prison sentences uh, amounting to more than one new crime every business day they were in office. France has voted 23 laws pertaining to crime and insecurity since 2002 and was uh, examining a 24th when, uh, happily, the presidency of President Sarkozy was interrupted. Mm. Um, there's also a diffusion of public discourse of vituperation of criminals and convicts, a widening of the penal net through the growth of alternative sanctions, post-custodial schemes of control, 
the exponential development of judicial databases and diversification of their use, particularly for the control of sexual offenders, the mushrooming of administrative retention centers throughout Europe where tens of thousands of irregular migrants are detained, awaiting protection and expulsion, and typically not even figuring into national uh, uh, incarceration um, uh, statistics. And lastly, the international diffusion of a new punitive common sense incubated in the United States and disseminated uh, by uh, think tanks, as I argue in my book, uh, Prisons of Poverty. So all of these developments are what? They're, they're an exercise in statecraft. They're part of the transformation of the state, the building of the neoliberal Leviathan. But to realize this, we must, do two, we must make two changes. First, we must change our conception of the prison. We must move from seeing the prison as a technical instrument to fight crime uh, to seeing the prison as a core capacity of the state entrusted with managing marginality, dispossessed and dishonored populations, and geared towards staging sovereignty. Marginality and sovereignty. In a sense, penality, marginality, sovereignty. These are the three categories that I want to uh, relate uh, to each other. And secondly, as I've, as I've already said, we need to change our conception of the state from this ambulance or service counter, or intruder uh, in the dark that intervenes downstream to remedy undesirable conditions and conducts generated by the market or civil society to an agency that stratifies and classifies and thus produces or co-produces inequality and marginality upstream. And of course then, it's going to react downstream. Yes, this is not to say the ambulance is not there. This is not to say the service counter is not there. This is not to say the intruder in the dark is not there. But it says they only appear on the scene after the state has done most of its job. So, <coughs> and so this is where, <coughs> as I've already <coughs> given you, <coughs> the punchline is what we can draw on Esping Anderson uh, and on Bourdieu. And I'm going to draw on these two authors, uh, with whom, uh, as you can imagine, I have some sympathy, um, to uh, put forth three propositions. First proposition, the penalization of poverty that we have observed in advanced societies over the last two or three decades is a reaction to the rise of the regime of advanced marginality. The expansion and glorification of the penal wing of the state, its aggressive deployment to manage problem populations and problem territories in the polarizing city of centuries turn is a major political transformation of the past 20 years. It is a response not to criminal insecurity, but to the rise of advanced urban marginality, as, as I characterize it in urban outcasts. Second proposition, if we want to understand that, we must relink social policy and penal policy. We must, because the activation of the penal state partakes of a new government of poverty that weds restrictive workfare and expensive prison fare, and ensnares the precarious fractions of the post-industrial proletariat in a carceral assistential mesh designed to steer them towards deregulated employment or to contain them in their dispossessed neighborhoods or in the booming prisons that are very largely sort of geographic extensions of these neighborhoods. And around the world, people are now beginning to discover that most of the regular clients of the jail or prison system come from a very small subset of neighborhoods, those neighborhoods that are also the urban hell holes that are increasingly becoming stigmatized in public discourse. Third, I'm going to argue that prison fare or the rolling out of aggressive pornographic penalty is a core component of the neoliberal state. Now, this is a paradox because we're used to, we are told that neoliberalism is about the, the withdrawal of the state, the hollowing out of the state, the coming of small government. I'm going to argue this is the ideology of neoliberalism. This is not the reality of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism everywhere where policies of economic neoliberalization have been pursued, what we've observed is on the contrary an expansion. Um, an intensification of penal activity. The ongoing capitalist revolution from above called neoliberalism entails the enlargement and the exaltation of the penal sector of the bureaucratic field so that the state may check the turbulence caused by the diffusion of social insecurity at the bottom of the class and spatial structure, resolve the Karl Polanyi problem, but also assuage popular discontent over the dereliction of the traditional economic and social duties of the state resolve the Karl Schmitt problem. So the penal state then is key to staging uh, sovereignty, to con curtailing uh, marginality. Um, let me see. Uh, so, uh, so I'm going to... Um, and 
I don't have the time to go into uh, the work that was needed and the sort of uh, analytic breaks that were needed to arrive at these, uh, I think, incontrovertible propositions. Uh, linking essentially the rise of a new regime of urban marginality to the restructuring of the state. But I'm going to briefly mention that th three breaks were needed to uh, come to this argument. The first, I had to break out of the crime, crime and punishment box, uh, which continues to straitjacket scholarly and policy debates on incarceration, even as the divorce between these two entities uh, is ever more blatant. The second break is what I'm going to turn into my second proposition, is that the need to link back social welfare and penal policy and to see them as two variants of poverty policy, which they were at their inception, again in the 16th century, it's not by happenstance if the penal prison and poor relief is invented as a state activity in the long 16th century, simultaneously, and indeed if they are um, uh, organized jointly and if they take a hybrid form at the beginning, the first penal prison was a workhouse. Uh, the first forms of relief entailed uh, incarceration and, conf and confinement. Uh, so I'm going to argue that uh, we need to relink social welfare and penal policy. We can't understand social welfare policy without understanding transformation of penal policy. And conversely, we can't understand the transformation of penal policy without paying due attention to uh, welfare policy. And of course, penal policy and welfare policy apply preeminently to target what the same population of uh, uh, struck by urban marginality. And thirdly, and the third and perhaps most uh, difficult rupture uh, over, uh, involves overcoming the customary opposition between material, material approaches and symbolic approaches to punishment, descended from the emblematic figures of Karl Marx on the one hand, who tells us that punishment is an, instru is an instrument uh, that is used sort of in a rational perspective to effect uh, class control, and then you have on the other side uh, Durkheim and the Durkheimians who tell us that punishment is a means of communication, is a means of drawing boundaries, of creating community, um, of dramatizing uh, shared values. And my argument will be quite simple, is that these two propositions are true and can be true and are true at the same time. The penal wing of the state is multi-layered, complex enough and capacious enough to operate in a way that fulfills those two functions simultaneously, the material control of difficult populations and the symbolic reassertion values, the creation of communities, the drawing of boundaries, and the designation of enemy categories. Um, so luckily, and this is why I call, you remember when I said we have the Karl Polanyi problem to solve, we have the Karl Schmitt problem to solve, and we have the Bourdieu solution, is that a single concept luckily for us, is enough to effect these three ruptures, to get out of the crime and punishment box, to relink social and penal policy, and to, uh, to heed, to hold together the material, the symbolic moment of the activities of the state. It is the concept of bureaucratic field that Bourdieu uh, uh, coined and forged in the, <coughs> in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, which is now, uh, which he developed in his uh, course uh, on the state, which was recently published, as you can see from the book cover, on that drawing, you can see how, how recent this is because this didn't exist before uh, January of this year. Um, and essentially, uh, Bourdieu's bureaucratic field will allow us to better understand the shape, the very, the, to understand that the very shape, the very mission, the priorities, the perimeter, the priorities, and the modalities of action of the state are all up for grabs. They are all they're the result of struggles. The state itself is the result of these struggles. The bureaucratic field is also a terrain of struggles, in particular between the left hand and the right hand of the state. And it's also an agent in struggles, and struggling uh, with uh, agents outside, you know, mobilized groups, uh, unions, political parties, demands coming from uh, uh, social space. Uh, but it is also a stake of struggles, that is, various entities struggle to seize not the state, but this or that agency inside the bureaucratic field, or to give more weight or less weight to this or that agency of the state. Because the state always, you know, the state has to come to define certain problems as pertinent to its action, then it has to choose what means of treatment do we use. So what do we define as an official social problem for which the state will be held accountable? And then once we have defined that problem, there's a question of how shall we treat that problem? So with Bourdieu, we can rethink the, the state, the bureaucratic field, as the set of bureaucratic agencies that have successfully monopolized the means of defining and 
<coughs> and distributing public goods. Or, to put it differently, th that have monopolized the official definition of social problems and the treatment that they shall receive. But this treatment always admits of multiple alternatives. Just to give you a very crude and concrete example, you uh, come across a, p a person sleeping on the streets, known as a homeless person. Uh, there's three ways in which the state can react. You can say, we will socialize that condition. We will attack the social mechanisms that are creating a dearth of low-income housing. Uh, we will build low-income housing such that the homeless will have a house over their head, or we will redistribute income so that no person will be left without the income sufficient to either purchase or rent housing. This is called socializing a condition that you have defined as a social problem for which the state shall be held accountable. Second solution, you can say oh, the persons are on the streets uh, because they are mentally deranged, because they suffer from psychiatric troubles. Uh, this is called medicalizing. Uh, homelessness. And this is a second possible response to uh, that condition. And the third possible condition is to say, we'll send our police and we'll arrest them and put these people behind bars once they become jail detainees, they cease to be homeless. That's a third way of resolving the problem. So here we see how socialization, first of all, of course, there's, first of all, the problem has to be defined as an official social problem for which the state shall be held accountable. And there's a first battle for that. And there are many conditions that are not deemed to be uh, you know, to be uh, issues that the state should regulate. Um, but, and there was a long battle to make the state sort of accountable for the condition of homelessness, to constitute homelessness as a civic and political issue in the first place. And then there's a second tier, second wave of struggles around, well, once we have defined homelessness as a condition around which that the state should treat, then how shall the state treat it? And for this, the concept of bureaucratic field uh, becomes uh, very useful because in that particular example, you see immediately, it forces us to link the economic and social wing of the state to the medical wing of the state to the penal wing of the state and to understand them not separately or in a one-to-one -one interaction with groups mobilized to defend the rights or the conditions of the homeless, but, but to understand them in relation to one another inside of the space of institutions that form the bureaucratic field. So with this single concept of bureaucratic field, <coughs> I'm going to um, come to uh, give you a sort of an analytic, um, compressed analytic uh, portrait of how the state produces, co-produces, regulates urban marginality. Um, I had planned to, um, to give you a sort of a brief genealogy around with, but I'm not going to do that other than say very quickly, take you around this triangle, this all started out, um, uh, this argument is an extension of an agenda of research that I pursued ac across a quartet of books um, that I was led uh, to write by the logic of my research. Originally, I'm not a student of penality, of crime and punishment, uh, and even less so of the state. I'm a student of urban marginality, and there's no racial domination, but I've been forced by what I found um, to migrate from urban sociology to the sociology of welfare, to the sociology of criminal justice, and finally to the theory of the state, globalization, and neoliberalism. This first started out as uh, trying to understand the, the, the class transformation under the onset of deregulation of the labor market, how it, this interacts with ethno-racial division um, in, in the United States. This takes the form of ethno-racial division between blacks and whites. In Western Europe, this takes the form of uh, ethno-national division between the citizens and post-colonial migrants, how this played out um, in the neighborhoods of relegation that are at the bottom of the uh, system of places that compose the city, starting with the black American ghetto, trying to understand how it became transformed into the hyper ghetto, refuting the thesis of convergence with Western Europe, where uh, the territories of the urban periphery are turning into anti-ghettos and not ghettos, and then this is what led me to, uh, uh, pr to put forth the thesis of emergence, emergence of a new regime of urban marginality, and that's contained in the book Urban Outcast. But then once advanced, and then, the <coughs> then for those who are, have always wondered what's the relation, in order to carry out the study of urban marginality, I found a boxing gym, I signed up in that boxing gym as a means of observation. I didn't know what I was getting into, and that's what led me to um, do a carnal ethnography of the craft of prize fighting, which is in a sense the complementary book to Urban Outcast. I look at them, for me, it's the same book. It's <coughs> one is a slice of life and labor on the south side of Chicago. It's a look um, of life uh, in the ghetto, and the other is an analytic dis and 
national and theoretical and comparative dissection of the ghetto was. Um, but then, once the, this new regime of urban marginality arises, the question becomes, how does the state react to it? And this is the second side of that triangle. The state reacts to the rise of this new regime of urban marginality that I characterize as fueled by having six distinctive properties, but the three major ones being that it is fueled by the fragmentation of wage labor and the double economic penalty of high unemployment and precarious wage work that becomes the normal horizon of, uh, of work for the post-industrial, uh, the unskilled fractions of the post-industrial working class by the functional disconnection between the evolution of these territories of relegation and the national and global economy and by the territorial stigmatization. How will the state react to this new form of urban marginality that paradoxically it has produced by deregulating the economy and shrinking the social safety net? It will react by a double punitive turn, by rolling out, by shifting from protective welfare to expensive workfare, uh, to uh, re restrictive workfare, and to uh, what I call prison fare by analogy. And this is, it's just, this is the that second part of the triangle. This is uh, what is analyzed in, in punishing the poor. <coughs> and then this leads you, uh, as any, any, any good triangle, this leads you with a third side of the triangle. Uh, it's a complicated matter uh, in itself. It's the relation between race as a delegated form of ethnicity. How does racial division accelerate, change, intensify the transformation of the state, both by activating the further class fragmentation and intensifying the social spatial concentration of urban marginality, and by facilitating the punitive shift on both the social uh, and the penal front. And that's uh, the topic of the uh, third book. <coughs> then this NDOC is coming out uh, at the end of the year. Um, then there's prisons of poverty, and, and uh, but I'm not going uh, to deal with that. So, um, so now let's let's uh, read, let's. I'm going to make three arguments, um, three brute argument. Argument number one: penalization is a response to advanced marginality. That is the penalization of poverty we can see, and the sudden growth and glorification of the penal state in the U.S. starting in the mid-1970s. This is so it's not by happenstance if it starts in the mid-1970s. And then in Western Europe two decades later, and again, it's not by happenstance if it, it, there's a lag of about two decades in Western Europe, does not correspond to a rupture in the evolution of crime and delinquency. The scale and the physiognomy of offending did not change abruptly at the start of these two periods on either side of the Atlantic. Neither does it translate a leap in the efficiency of the repressive apparatus, as we uh, are led to believe by zealots of the scholarly myths of zero tolerance uh, that has now spread around the world. Um, what happens is that it's not criminality that has changed, but rather it's the features and dynamics of urban marginality, and it's the gaze that urban elites train on certain street illegalities, that is, in the final analysis, on the dispossessed and dishonored populations, by status or by origin that are their presumed perpetrators and on the place they occupy in the city. Um, and here, essentially, it, it, um, the return, the argument, is the argument made in punishing the poor, that they renewed the resurgence of the prison or the growth and glorification of the penal apparatus in the post-Keynesian era of insecure employment is threefold. There are three things that the prison does for you. First, it works to bend the fractions of the working class that are recalcitrant to the discipline of the new fragmented service wage labor by increasing the cost of strategies of exit into the informal economy of the street. Thus, we see the uh, extremely diligent repression of low-level drug offending uh, in uh, neighborhoods of marginality. Secondly, the penal apparatus will neutralize and warehouse the most disruptive element of the post-industrial proletariat, those rendered wholly superfluous given the recomposition of the demand for labor. And thirdly, and very importantly, and this is where we must bring Jacquem alongside with our more materialist analysis, the rolling out of the penal state serves to reassert the authority of the state in daily life within the restricted domain that now the state assigns to itself. The canonization of the right to security, correlative of the dereliction of the right to employment in its own form, that is, full time with full benefits for an indefinite period and for a living wage enabling you uh, to reproduce yourself socially and to project yourself into the future. The canonization of the right to security, the increased interest and the increased resources granted to the enforcement of order come at just the right time to what to shore the deficit of legitimacy that political elites 
uh, suffer everywhere where they have abandoned the traditional social and economic missions of the state, established as a sort of uh, horizon of collective expectation during the Keynesian era. That is, we, the state can no longer, why would you vote for me? I can no longer give you a job, I can, give you, I can no longer secure your income, I can no longer give you social protection or housing or medical, but you know what, I'm going to vote for me because I'm going to clean those homeless criminals on, and those delinquent youth that are making your everyday life in your neighborhood so difficult. And, and so this is where, and this is where a return to uh, social history is enormously enlightening. No surprise that this would be the mission of the penal state at the beginning of the 21st century, since this was the mission of the prison when it was first invented in the long 16th century. If we return to the historical invention of penal confinement in the 16th century in such classic books as Rouge and Kirchheimer, Punishment and Social Structure, Vladimir Geremek, La Potence et la Pitié, Katarina Lys, and Hugo Soli, Poverty and Capitalism in Pre-Industrial Europe, or Peter Spierenberg, The Prison Experience, we found out that the prison was invented to manage not crime, but urban marginality, idleness, the sturdy beggar problem, during the epochal transition from feudalism to capitalism. Uh, throughout history, the prison has been targeted on dispossessed and dishonored populations. Let me just give you uh, a quote from the master book by uh, Geremek, uh, Punishment or Pity, Europe and the Poor from the Middle Ages to uh, the Contemporary Era, where he writes, before prison became a method of punishment and corrections for criminals on a large scale, scale, modern Europe made it into a tool for the implementation of its social policy towards beggars, and the means for the conspicuous affirmation of the work ethic in those countries that took the path of capitalist development. Peter Spieringer, Spieringberg, an eminent uh, historian of punishment, uh, confirms, Prison workhouses were originally meant as solutions to the problems of marginality and immorality rather than crime. Only later, between 1770 and 1870, did the prison become preemptively a form of criminal punishment. Uh, so the prison, uh, so we learned these four things. The prison was invented as an instrument to manage marginality. Second, the prison started out as a hybrid institution combining pity and punishment, welfare support, and penal redress. Then gradually, the social question and the penal question got separated. Roughly, my interpretation would be in the half century after 1848. This is where the great separation of the uh, social question and the penal question uh, comes along with the institutionalization of social work, trade unions, left-wing political parties on the one hand, and then uh, sort of professionalized criminal justice um, on the other hand. And my argument here is that what we have seen is the late 20th century has witnessed the re-merging the fusion and confusion of the social and criminal question at the bottom and the class ethnic order. Third proposition, the prison has always been deployed selectively. As you rise up in the class structure, the sanction for crime is typically moved from penal to civil law. Corporate crime and white collar crimes are treated very differently than lower class street crime, and this in every advanced society. Fourthly, the rise of the prison was part and parcel of modern state building in the 16th century. And uh, to this day, we could argue failing states are distinctively states that cannot monopolize violence, cannot have a functioning police, cannot have a minimally functioning criminal justice uh, system. <coughs> they fail to uphold the law and practice what is known sometimes in Latin America as the misrule of law. And so my argument is <coughs> transfer these findings from the 16th century to an early era of structural transformation, the late 20th century, early 21st century, and you have the same argument. And this is verified by the social profile of inmates. Uh, and I'll give you here briefly American inmates in county jails. Um, fewer than half of them uh, held a full-time job at the time of their arraignment. Two-thirds come from a household uh, that come from family households that live under half of the poverty line, not, not the poverty line. Two-thirds come from families living under half of the poverty line. Uh, only 13% as at some post-secondary education, compared to one-half for the national average. Let me turn to French inmates. French inmates, between one-third and one-half of French inmates were without a job at arraignment in uh, the year 2000. Half of persons incarcerated in France that year had an educational level of primary school only, primary school only for half of them, versus... Uh, only 3% who had attended some uh, university. Uh, 
Only uh, one in six inmates had no regular residence, meaning was homeless. One in six was homeless, and over one half were foreign or of, of, of foreign origin. Uh, today, more than ever in the in the twentieth in the twentieth century or twenty first century, the natural customers of European jails and prisons, as American jails and prisons, are the precarious fractions of the working class and most especially young people from working class families of post colonial ancestry, with a massive over representation of post-colonial post foreigners in Western Europe. In, indeed, I dug up the statistic that uh, post-colonial uh, migrants are more over-represented relative to nationals in European prisons than blacks are over-represented relative to whites in the United States. So for people who are indignant, and including my colleague, criminologists, who are indignant about the great racial, ethno-racial disparity of incarceration in the United States, they should be equally indignant about the great uh, ethno-national disparity in Western prisons. Second argument. Uh, I'm, we're going to skip this, unfortunately. It's a good one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> second, uh, we come to the second argument that penal and social policy interweave. They are joined and they cannot be understood in separation uh, from one another. Um, and for this, uh, Bourdieu's bureaucratic field is an enormously uh, useful tool. In the weight of the world, in related essays, Bourdieu proposes that we construe the state not as a monolith, not as a well-coordinated ensemble, as an apparatus, but as a splinter space of forces vying over the definition and distribution of public goods, which he calls the bureaucratic field. And the bureaucratic field has two... Uh, oh, have a board. Good. <coughs> you can think of the bureaucratic field as sort of an ovoid, like this, as a... Um, as those institutions that have successfully monopolized the official definition and distribution of public goods. And it has two poles. It has two poles, um, one or two hands in Bourdieu's language, and I think we can generalize that beyond the hands because it has not only two hands, it has many more than two hands. But there are two poles. Uh, and, and of course the hands have fingers, so how do you get from the hands to the fingers? But essentially, the left hand, the left hand and the right hand of the state are in Bourdieu's model um, the, the Ministry of, of, the, of the Economy or the Treasury that imposes uh, uh, budgetary discipline, and the left hand is the supportive, the social uh, ministries um, that, and, uh, that essentially this is what I would generalize as the supportive pole that supports and protects those who are short of economic and cultural capital. And this is the disciplinary hand. And the disciplinary hand, Bourdieu, uh, so I add what I do in punishing the poor. Essentially, Bourdieu tells us this is the Ministry of the Treasury. I say, yes, that's sort of the generic mechanism. But there is a very importantly, the police, the courts, and the prison system are a constituent element of the right hand of the state and have been since the emergence of, of, of modern uh, bureaucratic states. This is the feminine side of the state in terms of the traditional gender division of labor. This is the protective, this is the motherly. <coughs> and this is the masculine side of the state. Uh, this is the fatherly, this is the stern father who disciplines. And this is the mother uh, who protects. And what Bourdieu's scheme gives us is this idea that A, the shape, the extension, the shape, what's inside of this egg, in a sense, that's determined by historical struggle. So the state is itself the product of historical struggle. In some societies, for instance, health is a public good. It is delivered, guaranteed by the state. In other societies, it is not. But then there's a, there's a struggle to determine the shape, the perimeter, the shape, the priority, and the internal organization. And then there's a second wave of struggles that goes on inside of the bureaucratic field. That is, the bureaucratic field, as every field, is a space of forces and a space of struggles to change the distribution of power inside of this. And here, Bourdieu gives us what I call the horizontal, the key to understand the both vertical and horizontal struggles. <coughs> the vertical struggle is a struggle between the high state nobility, which wants to revamp the state to foster the marketization, commodification, and so on and so forth, smitten with this idea that markets are efficient, that state must solve. This is the neoliberal revolution in the head of the policy makers and policy decision makers. And then you have the low state nobility. And the low state nobility are the occupants of the uh, traditional social agencies who, are, who want to defend the traditional protective missions of the state. So you have the first 
So you have a wave of struggles from outside to change the perimeter of the priorities and the modalities of action. But you also have two struggles inside, the struggle between the vertical struggle between the high state nobility and the low state nobility, and the horizontal struggle between the left hand or the state and the right hand of the state, or the supportive agencies versus the disciplinary agencies. And um, <coughs> so this is, uh, and this allows us to get to understand the uh, emergence, the invention of the double regulation of the poor in the, uh, new, the age of neoliberal hegemony by inviting us to grasp in a single conceptual framework the various sectors of the state that administer the life conditions and the life chances of the lower class, and to view these various sectors as enmeshed in these relations of antagonistic cooperation as the different agencies of the state vie for preeminence inside of the bureaucratic field, uh, Bourdieu's concept helps us map the ongoing shift from the social to the penal management of poverty. Um, and it allows us to insert the police, the courts, and the prison as core constituents of the right hand of the state, alongside the ministries of the economy and the budget. It suggests that we need to bring penal policies from the periphery to the center of our analysis of the management of marginality. <coughs> and indeed, what we observe in, in, in a model developed, uh, put in place in the United States more fully, but tendentially uh, being proposed in other advanced societies and offer, offered as a model for them is a shift, a, a twofold movement. First, we have a movement from, we have a move, movement of problems, so problems, and then budgets and personnel are shifted from the left hand to the right hand. That's the first more evident ways whereby we see the rightward, the rightward tilting of the bureaucratic field. Say, you know, you used to treat your homelessness as a social condition that you used to build social housing and to provide income, now you are increasingly providing medical services or providing police services to where you are incarcerating more and more of your homeless population. That's the more. And then, so that's, that's the uh, transfer. And the second modality of the penalization of poverty is the colonization of the welfare sector or the supportive sector pull of the bureaucratic field by the panoptic and punitive logic, the disciplinary logic of the right hand of the state. And this is characteristic of the post-rehabilitation penal <coughs> bureaucracy. So here, so my argument here for, so essentially I've taken you from um, urban outcasts which diagnose the emergence of a new regime of urban marginality to uh, prisons of, to punishing the poor that diagnoses the emergence of this new model, new way of regulating the poor um, uh, by combining restrictive workfare and expensive prison fare. Uh, so in a sense, r revising and ex expanding, building uh, on, but also beyond, the classic work of Piven and Cloud, who in, in regulating the poor, argue that you know, the state expands and constructs its social welfare uh, coverage in keeping with the ups and downs of the economy. My argument is that this was true during the 40s Keynesian era, roughly between 1880 and 1980. And after, after 1980, what happens is no longer this accordion-like expansion and contraction of social welfare. What we see is the mutation of welfare into workfare on the left-hand side of the state and the uh, runaway expansion of prison fare uh, on uh, the right-hand side of the state. <coughs> to the single oversight of the poor by the left hand of the state succeeds the double regulation of poverty by the joint action of punitive welfare turned workfare and a diligent and belligerent penal bureaucracy. The cyclical alternation and contraction and expansion of public aid is replaced by the continual contraction of welfare and the runaway expansion of prison fare. Now, I'm going to come to uh, five the five, well, to the core. Uh, to, to, and I'm going to show you how the core of the model, how we can see how the state produces uh, it's not simply a manager of urban marginality, but, but actually produces and shapes it, determines it both its intensity, but also the form that it takes, the treatment that it is given, and the way in which it coalesces in particular zones of social and physical space. Here what we see is, this is the start. Under a neoliberal regime, you have economic deregulation, which is really a misnomer because it's re-regulation in favor of firms. But this re-regulation in favor of firms, which translates into the flexibilization of labor, the rise of high unemployment, and high volumes of precarious wage work creates uh, social insecurity. 
um, uh, which uh, of course concentrates at the bottom of the class structure, at the bottom of the urban structure, which feeds social anxiety, um, which circulates throughout the society, um, which is fed, um, so uh, this, this, this social insecurity is objective social insecurity for the working class and then subjective social insecurity for the lower reach, reaches of the middle class, which fears two things, falling down, downward mobility, I lose my job, I lose my wife, I lose my home, I find myself homeless. Um, uh, upwards of 75% of French people fear becoming homeless. This is an absurd statistic when you think of it, because probably less than one half of 1% have an actual risk. But, but, but the subjective fear of becoming homeless is much, much wider than suggesting that there's a disconnect between social, objective social insecurity and subjective social insecurity, which feeds this current of social anxiety. Now, the traditional way of, of controlling, curtailing this social insecurity was to expand the social safety nets. That's the Piven and Cloward model. But with the coming of the neoliberal revolution, there's no longer expansion of the social safety net. Why? Because if you keep your social safety net, your precarious workers are not going to accept the insecure position that are now the normal horizon of work for the post-industrial proletariat. So what you have to have is a shift from protective welfare to disciplinary workfare. Conditional support by the state, conditional on orienting yourself towards these insecure wage work positions and accepting them eventually. So what we see there is that um, there's, uh, when you shift from social welfare to workfare, you double down, you intensify your social insecurity. Instead of curtailing it, you only install it and you intensify it. This is further intensified, as I mentioned, by the uh, fear of downward mobility and, and also for the middle class, the fear of the not being able to transmit their middle class status to their children. That comes from the intensification of school competition, that comes from the universalization sort of secondary schooling and so on and so forth, so that even if you've pushed your children and, you've, and they've done well, they've gone to the university, if they go to university, they're not guaranteed that they'll have a degree. If they get a degree, they're not guaranteed that they'll have a job. If they get a job, that job doesn't guarantee that it will be stable and it will provide sufficient income to purchase the package of goods that will signify their middle class status. So there's great anxiety among this middle class. Um, uh, this transmission, this is what I call the transmission crisis. Um, and then <coughs> it's act further activated by transmissions in the family forums, the age and gender sexuality, anxiety, school competition, and of course you have media and political operators that will play on this social anxiety, and this all creates this deficit of legitimacy for political <coughs> elites. Um, and this is, how, this is where now you come to the rolling out of penal, the penal wing of the state. Your penal activation will allow you to, on the one side, curtail, control, and at least contain social disorders within the neighborhoods of relegation where precarious employment where uh, the shift from welfare to workfare is concentrated. This is this, this I should have put this in, but it took me so, so long to do this drawing. I'm very bad at that. It took me six hours to do this drawing, so I couldn't afford another hour just to add. Uh, but, but essentially, this is resolving your Karl Polanyi problem. You roll out your penal state to curtail and control the disorders that you used to curtail by rolling out social welfare. See, the, 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 the counter-movement from the society. But now the counter-movement comes from within the bureaucratic field. It's the right-hand side of the state that provides the counter-movement and that resolves the Karl Polanyi problem by containing the social insecurity in and around the neighborhoods of, of, of relegation or in the prisons that are essentially their, their spatial extension. And it also resolves the question of the, the deficit of legitimacy. You now reassert the authority of the state and you have something to sell to your electorate, paradoxically, particularly your lower class electorate, which is in high demand of the primary mission of the state, which is to provide order, to fight disorder of every kind. The state responds to social disorder by providing criminal order. And, and by providing the spectacle of criminal order. Because, uh, we, we, but essentially this is resolving your Carl Schmidt problem. So when you roll out your, your penal, and so you have this sort of thing, and my argument is that this, there's, a, there's a structural and functional connection between these. When you have, when you deregulate your economy, you will have high employment and high life insecurity at the bottom of the class structure and in your urban periphery. How, do you, how could you resolve that? Well, you could socialize it, you could medicalize it. Medicalization, actually, there's, there's need for more research to add here the medical wing of the state, because there has been, France is the country that uses the most, uh, um, calmants, uh, pharmaceuticals to, uh, to quiet people. 
uh, pharmaceuticals which are typically used en masse in prison systems to also quiet people inside of prison. And then, so what you have, but here, when you move, you need, in order to, uh, to impose precarious wage labor, you need to move from protective welfare to some variant of workfare, so social activation policy. When you do that, you double down on social insecurity. You only redouble your trouble, and now you create your deficit of legitimacy. You roll out your penal state, and you hope to resolve the two problems at the same time. So, <coughs> and now, of course, when you throw in then uh, racial division and migration, immigration, and when you have this extremely concentrated in physical space, then then this 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 intensifies your the profits, and it intensifies the velocity and the intensity of uh, of penal activation. So uh, I'm going to conclude then. Uh, if I had more time, I would have shown you that this you can show a clear connection between these variables: the degree internationally, the degree of economic deregulation, the degree of flexibilization of the unskilled labor force, the degree to which you've moved to a very uh, um, obligations-oriented uh, workfare system, and the degree to which you see uh, uh, um, high incarceration. Um, in particular, I want to uh, point to the Downs and Hansen article. Uh, welfare and punishment in comparative perspectives that shows that in, in for Western Europe there was no connection between welfare and criminal uh, uh, punishment trends in the in the early 1990s. But by, by the end of the century, there is a strong connection. And I'm going to conclude. I, if I had time, I would have shown you how this is part and parcel of the building of the neoliberal state. Essentially, my argument then is that the neoliberal neoliberalism is not the coming of market rule. Market rule is only one element, but market rule creates trouble. Market rule creates troubles that must be overcome. So the neoliberal state is not simply the state that fosters the market, that institutes market, that, 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 that the entrepreneurial state, the technological state, the state that fosters uh, enterprise, capital accumulation, and so on, and, and, market, and, 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 and market rule. It is also the state that will overcome the resistance to the market and repair the social consequences <coughs> of this commodification. So it is a state that has to have a strong workfare component. It is a state that has to have a strong uh, penal uh, component, and it is a state that deploys the trope of individual responsibility as the glue that ties together those uh, four elements. And I would have shown that uh, this is an element, the, in particular the prison fare element is an element that has been missed both by advocates of the neoliberal state, Anthony Giddens in the third way, and critics of the neoliberal state, uh, David Harvey. Um, and that leads me to uh, argue that we should look at penality as a core state capacity. Uh, penality is that institution that draws lines in social space and that affects penal segmentation, and particularly penal segmentation between the, the criminalized and the non-criminalized sectors of the working class creates a very deep division that we should add to social, political, and civic citizenship, judicial citizenship, and we should think of the criminal justice system as an instrument of classification, of producing a negative sociodicy, of justifying the dereliction of the, uh, uh, the marginal uh, population. Um, and this leads me to conclude then that the sociology of state crafting, uh, but that because history has brought the prison back to the institutional forefront of advanced societies in response to rising social insecurity and this regime of new uh, marginality, we need to bring the penal state uh, back to the center of the sociology of urban inequality and marginality. For that, we must change the ways in which we think of the state and the ways in which we think of the prison. I have tried to draw on social history and the social theories of Polanyi, Schmidt, uh, Esping Anderson and Bourdieu, and a comparative analysis of the penalization of urban poverty in post-industrial society a centuries turn to propose that the police, the courts, the prison system are not just technical tools to handle deviance, but core political capacities to which the state stratifies and classifies, manages marginality, and stages sovereignty, and defines essentially the boundaries and import of citizenship. This is why I conclude and I want to urge you to uh, heed the role of the state in the production and the management of uh, marginality, and particularly to pay attention to the transmission of the penal state um, in, this, uh, in this regard. Thank you. scheduled to have a break uh, in 10 minutes time, so we have 10 minutes for uh, any questions which may arise. Or I resolved all... Uh... <laughs>
I did resolve the Polani problem and the Kafka problem. Yes. Um, as Jacob said, yes. I like that idea of the European field and you start to do with it. And I appreciate right. the way in which you draw all your work <coughs> together. I think it's marvelous to do that at that speed. Um, what I have a bit of a trouble make with is, I think, the sort of question of intentionality. I think uh -huh. what I struggle to understand is where the political, I, do I dare say field, uh -huh. where the political is there. And to what extent, I mean, of course, Bureaucrats have discretionary space, they make their own decisions, and I think there's beautiful studies that also show that there's things that are against the penal state. Um, and so, yeah, so I think the question is, what, what is the relationship between the political project of neoliberalism, if there is such a thing, which I'm not really sure, <coughs> on the one hand, and sort of bureaucratic group on the other? Excellent question, which points to a nest of complicated issues. I'm just, uh, this morning, before I came, I'm just trying to finish a response to a debate in the journal Social Anthropology, which has a series of comments on a paper that I wrote called Three, Three Steps Towards the Historical Anthropology of Neoliberalism, that raises this very issue where everybody asks, where is intentionality, where is intentionality, and where the difficulty is that bureaucratic field is only one, uh, one tool and one step in the analysis. Once we understand bureaucratic field well, and the concept is in need of more refinement, there's, there's actually, Bourdieu gives us three concepts to think of state rule uh, and the management, the production and management of marginality. One is bureaucratic field, <coughs> the other is political field, uh, and the third is juridical field. Uh, and to complicate it all, they're all contained within the field of power, uh, which uh, has, in a sense, as its pole, uh, the symbolic or the cultural pole at the left, and then at the right, the economic field. Um, and so part of it is to, part of the virtue, the virtue of bureaucratic field is to force us to do the nitty gritty analysis of what happens, uh, you know, it's not, it's not self-evident uh, to, to use the, I think the bad title and the wrong thesis of one of my, of my colleagues at Berkeley, uh, Jonathan Simon in his book, uh, Governing Through Crime. It is not self-evident that governing through crime will take the form of punishment. Governing through crime, that is using crime as a means of establishing political authority, of making the state operate, of, of uh, relating to the citizen. Governing through crime, through crime, governing through crime could have taken the form of uh, uh, re-establishing the medical state, re-establishing the social welfare state. Uh, so it's not a foregone conclusion. Part of it comes from, so we are attuned to look at this uh, through political, the eyes of political sociology and social movement theory as there are demands from outside the state that come into and ask that we shift from the social welfare to the penal treatment. And the argument that I hear Bourdieu make and that I think is a very strong one is that many of the transformations that we attribute to a struggle from agents outside the state towards the state are in fact the changing balance of power inside of the bureaucratic field. Or, and more generally, and the balance of power inside the bureaucratic field itself cannot be understood outside of the changing position of the bureaucratic field in the field of power, the changing relation between economic power, political power, juridical power. And so it's a, it's a, <coughs> it's itself, it's a series of sort of nested difficulties. It's, but, but if we don't have bureaucratic field, we take it as a given that the response, you know, we, we don't uh, empirically investigate why it is and where was the tilting from the social welfare to the penal treatment of marginality, where did it occur? And my idea so about intentionality is that it's, it's the conflux of a threefold transformation. There's a set of actors that are fighting on the economic front. So you have uh, trade unions, large corporations, uh, uh, a whole series of agents that fight uh, from the 1970s on, and that leads to the gradual re-regulation of labor in favor of firms. That's one stream of change. And then there's a second stream of struggles, which has to do with social welfare. Uh, there again, you have, you know, uh, welfare recipient organizations, social workers, politicians, uh, the media, and so on and so forth, who are fighting about, you know, what are welfare recipients, who should be welfare recipients, who should receive what, under what conditions, and so on and so forth. And of course, this interacts in part with the set of struggles that are going on in the property economic field. Uh, 
And then you have a third set of struggles that are going on in the judicial, in the judicial field uh, itself around criminal justice issues. You know, should uh, criminals be uh, sanctioned? Should they be mandatory minimum sentences and so on and so forth? And these are sort of three relatively independent set of struggles. And they come to coalesce, and they come to have effects on one another, and they come to share solutions, and they come to have to design solutions that are transferred from one to the other, in part because they target the same population, in part because the same trope of individual behaviorism and moralism takes hold in all three sectors, and because uh, technologies and programs are transferred from one to the other. Um, uh, I am struck when I look at uh, workfare programs, particularly the 1996 welfare reform bill, uh, welfare reform, so-called welfare reform in the United States, how <coughs> in many, and in England it's very similar, um, the, the workfare programs, that is social activation programs, they're essentially almost like a, a, a work, they're a work probation program. They, and they are run exactly like the judicial runs its probation. That is, you are entitled to some support by the state, provided that you engage in certain behaviors. If you don't meet those behavioral standards, you have a series of penalties, and eventually you become ineligible, or you become uh, subjected to a much deeper sanction. And you change category, and then when you change tier or category, suddenly there's a whole series of new behavioral standards that you have to match. There's surveillance, there's a creation of cases, there's a creation, there's an apparatus of measurement, and increasingly those bureaucracies, uh, probation agencies, social welfare agencies, employment agencies, are increasingly those bureaucrats also have quantitative indicators of people whom they must process and they must produce numbers and so on, so of people at Pôle emploi in France, they, you know, increasingly they, 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 they will get, the bureaucrats who manage these populations, get, for instance, bonuses if they place their people in work, if they place their people in work, if they place, if they make sure that the, their former inmates don't uh, reoffend. Um, and so increasing, so the same bureaucratic models, the same bureaucratic technologies, the same moral behaviorist uh, vision is targeted on what happens to be the same population. Because when you look at these three streams of struggles, but now, so there is plenty of intentionality at every level, but not an intentionality to create this overall contraction and convergence. The, the, the bureaucratic, the, the, the neoliberal state as it emerges as the combination of these four uh, elements is not uh, is not the uh, subject to design to rational design in, in part because uh, uh, one of the great virtues I think of bureaucratic field it allows you also to track down the contradictions between the actions of the different elements of the state um, and in, indeed one of the ways of putting my argument is that the state is now trying to uh, to control with its penal wing the social trouble that it has created it's trying to control with its with one of its uh, with its, the, the penal uh, side of its right hand, uh, right hand, it's the penal finger of its right hand, uh, the troubles that it has created by the by the budgetary, uh, by the by the deregulation of the economy has created the unemployment and the festering life insecurity that creates the 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 urban troubles that are then managed by used to be managed by but by the social welfare wing, but since the social welfare wing is now increasingly an instrument of surveillance and discipline, a trampoline to push people into low-wage employment, it only creates more trouble, and the state is now, so now prisons are full everywhere, they don't know where to put inmates, because they have too many, and it's completely irrational, so I, I want to insist on that, because sometimes people say, oh, this is a, this is, you provide us with a functional, yes, it's a functional analysis, but not a functional explanation, it's not because there's a function served that this is why it happened, and indeed, this is, this is profoundly irrational, full of contradictions. There are contradictions in each of the wings of the state, but there are also further contradictions when you see that uh, here you're asking the right hand of the state to pick up the troubles created by the withdrawal of the left hand of the state. Wouldn't be easier to just roll out the left hand of the state, but you can't roll out the left hand of the state because the, your, your treasury and your budget and now your budgetary constraints are such that you could no longer do that. Um, or you know, or the European Union says that you can no longer. But but who is the so and uh, okay. So that's that's a, that's a, that's a way of answering the question. Right. Uh, one more question uh, from the back. <laughs> yes. Um, it's a different kind of question. Um, your your analysis presupposes that the penal system is very much within the domain of the state. Uh -huh. 
And I wondered what it does to your model where that is not the case, either because it is partially outside of uh -huh. the state, no whereas in the case uh -huh. where it normally is, uh -huh. and in many cities in the world, where punishment of multiple kinds falls almost completely outside of the domain of the state. Uh, what, what there are no prisons in most parts of the world. Ah, um, okay. You mean uh, if we go comparatively? Yes. Yeah. I, one but, of the but even in, even in, in many, I mean, in, in there are a large number of places where there systems are, of, 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 of incarceration, systems of punishment are not all state controlled. Um, because of the failure, yeah. When states fail, yes. Uh, when states fail, I, I, I reassure you, out of 190 members of the United Nations, all of them have a prison system. Which is not to say that it's a functioning prison system. Many countries in Africa have incarceration rates in the 20s and 30s, when European countries have incarceration rates in the hundreds, and, and the United States has 740. So there's huge variation, but that's because of the failure to build a state, and the, the fail, so failing states or states with weak administrative capacities, with weak, weak capacities to uh, penetrate and organize social space, weak capacities to surveil populations and to meet out goods and to provide the basic... So if, if, if you fail to provide a, you know, a minimal, minimally capacious bureaucratic field, then indeed you're not gonna, you're not gonna regulate your population through penalization. So one of the criticisms that I received from a colleague, uh, Mathieu Ilgares, who's an anthropologist of Africa, says, but accounts theory doesn't apply to Africa because in most of Africa there is no there's no shift to welfare because there's no there's no shift to workfare because there was no shift there was no welfare to start with and there is no prison fare. To which I answer yes, and you've just validated my argument. It's only where you only where you have a state that has the only essentially where you've had collective solutions to the management of the economy, which could take a Keynesian form or a socialist form that is only in the north. So one of the criticisms was. This is a North Atlantic centered model. Yes, because only in the North, neoliberalism is a North Atlantic centered project. It has had offshoots, but in, in, in Africa, there is no neoliberalism in Africa. Because there's, there's, there is the invocation of the language. What there is is classic, is classic liberalism. That is, withdraw the state and let <coughs> private operators operate. But neoliberalism is not, this is precisely the argument that I make, neoliberalism is not the, retur the, the return of it, it, neoliberalism was constructed out of the uh, Lippmann uh, seminar, the Colloque Lippmann and the Montparnasse Society, as a double reaction. A reaction against classic, neoliberalism, uh, cl against classic liberalism and its failed conception of the state, and against collective, collective solutions to the management of the economy, be they socialist solutions or be they Keynesian solutions. And the, the, the innovation, what is neo about neoliberalism is precisely the methodical systematic use of the state, not only to produce and protect markets, but to, to resolve the troubles created by the rolling out of the commodity form, and also to shape subjectivities and social relations in market-conforming ways. So my colleagues who are advocates of the Foucauldian governmentality, you know, neoliberal governmentality, they argue that in those countries you have neoliberal, neoliberalism has arrived, in the form of these neoliberal technologies of governmentality that circulate, that mutate, that combine, and so on and so forth. After the debate, at least that's my argument, you know, after the debate, it's clear from their responses that they cannot come up with a definition of what is a neoliberal technology of government. There is no such thing as a neoliberal a technology. is a technology. It can be put, transparency, accountability, uh, privatization even, can be put to use to reinforce a patrimonial power, a socialist power, a social democratic agenda, or a neoliberal agenda. So, the, the, so there is no such thing as a neoliberal technology of government, and there's no, there's no such thing as neoliberalism in those countries. So the, the, the quick response was that, that you, you are only going to use the, the notion of bureaucratic field in those societies where indeed there has been the formation of a rational bureaucratic state in the Weberian sense, and for those, uh, those other societies you could raise the question of uh, why is it that the bureaucratic field failed to be formed? Is it because there's a... It's, and these are typically you know, predatory states, these are failed states, patrimonial states, predatory states. Um, but everywhere where you've had a social democratic, a de de developmental uh, you know, uh, state where you've had a... Then I think the model, uh, the model is useful.
And even uh, so, to, to return to that to that exception, the, the two the two continents that are very interesting to go comparatively is Latin America and Africa. Africa less because in Africa only I would argue only South Africa would be an exception because it did build a massive administrative capacity to penetrate and regulate social space because of the apartheid regime. And so it could use that capacity to then, indeed, and it's not by heaven sense, that South Africa incarcerates at 300 uh, per, per 100,000 residents and has tripled its, and, has, and has essentially maintained its incarceration rate from a state of civil war to you know, peace, but with very high incarceration rate. Latin America is even more interesting because in Latin America you have more variation and in Latin America, you can see the beginnings of the building of a strong state, not only a, 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 an export-oriented, proto-developmental state in Brazil and in Argentina in particular, and in Chile. And, and my argument is, it's not by happenstance, it's Chile is the leader of incarceration in Latin America. Since when? Since the Pinochet coup. And if, if Brazil and Argentina, if, if Brazil uh, has had a, a, a similar trajectory, and there's a, there's a young German political scientist who just, who's just published an article on the penal state in Latin America that, that uses that model and extends it and it works primarily on Mexico. So, so uh, the portrait, in a sense, what I've presented here is a sort of a, a, a static, ideal, typical case of the fully realized relationships. But then you can take that as the benchmark whereby you look at historical variations, cross-national variations, variations over time, both in the emergence and the formation of the bureaucratic field, in its internal